Martin, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Clint McKinney. Dr. Clint McKinney is an emergency department physician in rural Minnesota and has worked in health care for over 30 years. He has 14 years experience as a rural family medicine physician, which includes both private practice and large health care systems. Dr. McKinney is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Health Management and Policy at the College of Public Health at the University of Iowa. He is also Deputy Director of the Rural Policy Research Institute Center for Rural Health Policy and Analysis. Dr. McKinney has served on various national committees for the Institute of Medicine, the Department of Health and Human Services, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and the American Medical Association. He is the former medical director for a globally capitated primary care group and is a nationally recognized rural health advocate, consultant, speaker, and author. Now, I'll turn it over to Clint. Good morning, everyone, um, or I guess it's good noon. This is a little bit unusual for me because it's 9 o'clock where I am, and uh, we will kind of see if I can kind of get going here with only minimal coffee. So um, what I'd like to talk about um, today is a tool uh, that we developed at the uh, World Health Value of, uh, Project. It's called Value-Based Care Strategic uh, Planning. So let me kind of get, get going with that. If I can make the mouse work here, okay. So th this is the project that we're actually working with, the Rural Health Value Project. And what we wanted to do with this is to build a knowledge base through research, practice, and collaboration that helps create high-performance rural health systems. It helps, um, we hope to be able to help rural providers and rural communities move from this volume-based care and volume-based payment world we're in right now uh, to one that's increasingly looking like a value-based payment and value-based care um, world. Through this project, we're developing tools and resources, technical assistance and research. And, and this value-based care strategic planning tool is one of those tools and resources uh, that we've developed. So as, by way of background, all of you are experiencing this in rural health care. Um, one, uh, we're, we, we're having price reduction, uh, uh, for example, um, for the physicians who um, you may employ or physicians that are in your area, they will realize through Medicare a 0.3% uh, um, price drop in their services from Medicare. When we see things like um, uh, readmission reduction plans, um, that's volume reduction. And this is important because if you remember, if we're operating in a fee-for-service world, our revenue as a health, rural health care provider is dependent on only two factors. One, the price, and two, um, the volume. Price times volume equals revenue. So if there's price reduction threats, and there's volume reduction threats, in this new world, or in this current world of fee-for-service, we will be seeing our revenue going down. Simultaneous to that, our expanding insurance coverage, which of course is a good thing, but narrower insurance networks. So increasingly, we will have a challenge being included in insurance networks. There's increasing quality of care measures and accountabilities. As a physician, I think that also is a good thing. And all of this and much others is driving widespread healthcare provider affiliations. Physicians and hospitals, hospitals and hospitals, hospitals and systems, hospitals and systems and insurance companies, providers and insurance companies, widespread hospital or widespread provider affiliations. All of this is probably coming back to the triple aim. And I've got to pat myself a little bit on the back. Um, it was actually in 2006, long before this concept really became popular, that I kind of came up with this equation of value equals quality plus patient satisfaction or patient experience divided by cost. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but, geez, I can figure out kind of addition and, and division to figure out that if the consumer and the payer is demanding something different, in healthcare, rather than just price and volume, what they're really looking for is this value. And what's indeed happening now is the healthcare payment system is starting to move in that direction towards value, rather than this old rubric that I just described of price times volume equals revenue. They're moving more towards how do we start thinking about rewarding healthcare value, which simply 
is value is quality plus experience divided by cost. So about one year ago, about one year ago, Secretary Burwell um, from HHS announced what I think is a bombshell. And all of a sudden, there is a stake in the ground. And this is kind of what she said. She said, by the end of 2018, 50% of Medicare payment will flow through alternative payment models. Those are shared savings programs, which is also known as ACOs, or accountable care organizations, patient-centered medical homes, and bundled payments. Now, she wasn't through. Still at 50% at the end of 2018. This still re re um, this still, uh, leaves over, leaves left, um, fee-for-service. And for that remaining fee-for-service, 90% of that will be linked to quality or value. This, in my opinion, is a very aggressive timeline. And, and I knew, I think all of us kind of in healthcare policy knew something like this was coming. But we just didn't expect it would be that fast for her stake in the ground. So this aggressive timeline favors those organizations, healthcare organizations with financial risk management experience, population health management experience, and to weather the transition, deep pockets. But I firmly believe with good planning, thoughtful experimentation, we in rural can compete in this new world. And that's what this, is, this uh, presentation really is all about. So it's about accountable care, accountable kind of in italicies, because it, it's, not, it's not an accountable care organization. It's being accountable for the care. And, and as my friend Eric Schell says, accountable care is monetizing the value derived from increasing quality and reducing costs. What we did in the past was monetize volumes and price negotiations. And I kind of asked myself, and I would ask all of you, is this really the kind of health care, are these the kind of financial incentives you'd really want for the team that's taking care of your mother or your child? Now, I, I think all of us would say, of course not. But yet, that's exactly what we've been operate on, operating under. And I'd also argue for those people who says, yeah, 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 I've seen this all before. You know, I saw, I saw managed care in the 1990s, and it was awful. And I've seen this, and I've seen that. Well, I, I, I do think that this is different. And here's some of the differentiating factors. It's the providers that are monitoring, monetizing the value now, not the insurance companies. Although they are far from where they should be, we do have new information systems that help us with that population health management and that financial risk management. We have new clinical protocols, again, that still need lots and lots of work, but again, much more developed in the 1990s. And if we if we just take a moment to look at where the major payer is going for us in rural, which is Medicare, that's the 800-pound gorilla. When Medicare speaks, we all should listen. There is an unrelenting movement in all of their um, rhetoric and all of their policies towards this value-based payment system. So in essence, alternative payment models pay for value. They pay they are value-based payment as opposed to fee for service and cost-based reimbursement, which those of you who are CAHs live under, they pay for volume. They pay for volume. This is a fundamental, fundamental difference. Now, lest you think this isn't happening in rural, think again. These are um, studies that we do at Rupri, looking at where um, counties in the United States where there is um, ACO or accountable organization, Medicare accountable care organization presence. And these, the, the blue or, or light green that you see on the screen is non-metropolitan counties with ACO presence. This is expanding way faster than I ever thought it would. Uh, let's see, I guess it was about 2012 or something like that. I actually um, was able to sit down at a hotel bar and have a beer with Elliot Fisher. And Elliot Fisher is the guy who kind of coined the term accountable care organization. Parenthetically, he doesn't really like that term, but that, that being the case doesn't matter. Um, he said, you know, Clint, this is really going to go. And I said, ah, I don't know. You know 
I, I, was, I was being that naysayer from the 1990s. You know, I think it's going to be slower and rural. He said, no, no, I don't know, Clint. I think it's going to go. Well, I was dead wrong. This is expanding way faster than I thought it would. And you can see this right, right on the map. And, and the truth is right, right now that there are over 700 public and private ACOs. And remember, this really didn't start up until 2012. You know, just a short time ago, over 700 public and private ACOs, over 20 million patients, over 400 Medicare ACOs. And you know why I use those plus signs? Because it's changing so darn fast, I can't keep up with the slides. So it, it's that many. And it's in ACOs are op operating right now in 49 states and the District of Columbia. There's only one state that's the laggard, and, and that's where I'm sitting talking to you right now up in Alaska. There's only one. Now, people often think, well, that's just Medicare. That's just, maybe it's not just, it's just Medicaid. Well, not true. Not true. As goes Medicare, as goes Medicaid, so goes the commercial market. And, and some studies done by the um, uh, Catalyzing Payment Reform Group um, looked at the percent of um, commercial payments to healthcare providers that were linked in some way to value. That would be either clinical quality, patient satisfaction, and or efficiency. 40% of commercial payments um, in 2014 were linked to values. The studies haven't been completed for 2015. But compare that to 2013, 11%. 11%. And I said bipartisan. But a, a group of healthcare providers, large healthcare providers, large healthcare insurers, um, purchasers of healthcare, and patient advocacy groups have all come together and said our goal is to have that number of 75% by 2020. So to think that this is also not happening in the commercial world, we've got no place to hide anymore if that's your intent. This is moving and it will be relentless. So as I comment in this last bullet, value-based payment has legs. Now it may not be accountable care organizations. In fact, I, I think accountable care organizations are simply a launching point. They're a launching point for alternative payments to this admittedly wacky world of fee-for-service in which we live in. And, and in fact, um, we're talking now about, which I think is much more exciting but, but devilishly difficult to kind of get our hands around, is accountable care communities. So, so this, this process is moving, and we need to start figuring out how we get prepared for it. One other thing that I think is as important as any is what I've told you before. Now, maybe some of you have been tracking on sustainable growth rate. Um, physicians should be tracking on this. The AMA sure tracks on it, and the American Academy of Family Physicians sure does. So let me just give you just a very, very brief summary. So in 1997, the Balanced Budget Act um, put in place this thing called SGR. SGR was a way for the government to adjust payment to physicians if they if physicians in mass increased Medicare volume. So the essence was with with some with adjustments for inflation that if we started um, billing Medicare for more services, we, they would actually the next year cut cut our pay. So they tried to do that several times over the or since 1997, and each year um, Congress actually stayed the execution and uh, did not allow the pay cut to physicians to go into place. But each year, I mean, the American uh, Medical Association, AAFP, and other physician organizations lobby hard against this. Everybody hates, hated it because it's like the sword of Damocles that was hanging over your head at the beginning of every year. So all the lobbyists, you know, were fighting for physician pay in Washington, and, and everybody hated it. So I, I kind of joke with physicians, be careful what you ask for. So in April of, of 2015, MACRA was passed, bipartisan, bipartisan, signed by Obama. And for those that think this health care reform stuff will go away once we throw that bum Obama out of office, I'm kidding. Um, it, it, they're, they're wrong. Um, MACRA is bipartisan, overwhelmingly supported by both houses of Congress and signed into law by the president. And this is very important. First, it allows for a very minimal update in our payment from physicians over the next five years and 0% after that. And coincidentally, in 2016, due to some other legislative action, it wasn't a 0.5% increase. It was a 0.3% decrease in 2016. And if you figure in inflation, let's just say 
for kicks and giggles that inflation is 2%, physicians will be seeing, will be realizing a net loss in revenue from Medicare over the next decade. But it's being replaced by this. The merit-based incentive payment system are called MIPS. This will be starting to phase in starting in 2019, phased in over four years. And it will eventually lead to um, a potential of a 9% decrease in physician payment based on performance and up to a potential 27% increase based on physician performance. And they're even throwing in kind of a, an exceptional performance bonus up to 10%. That hasn't really been defined yet. But, but the lowdown here is if you're one of the curmudgeon physicians or you have those curmudgeon physicians in your employ who say, I don't want to do this darn stuff, I don't want to do this, 9% decrease, but the person down the street who's all about quality and patient satisfaction and meaningful use and clinical practice improvement, 37%, 36% differential, over a third differential in payment. One last little bit here that's very important. So if you don't want to do that MIPS, the way you can get around it is join an alternative payment model of payment. That is, remember, accountable care organization, patient-centered medical home, the bundle payments. And if you do that, if you do that, you just get a 5% bonus right there, out of, the, out of the chute, don't have to worry about MIPS, don't have to worry about meaningful use, none of that stuff. But you have to have some skin in the game, and that's yet to be determined. How much physician risk level is required is to be determined. But guess why, why this is important? Physicians will want to be aligned with those hospitals and those health systems that can offer them an APM. And if they cannot, there will be hospitals and health systems who will scoop those patients out from under you. So we really need to pay attention to the drivers of revenue in our hospitals and our health systems are, which are generally physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and other clinicians. We need to be to see how they, they are being incented as we move forward into this new payment world. And this APM 5% bonus, I think, is huge. It's huge. So how do we start kind of getting ready for that? Let me back up one time. This is, I threw this slide in for you just so you have something back to reference. This comes from the AAFP, talks a little bit about the macro physician payment timeline, and is a reference for you kind of going forward. Again, stakes in the ground. This starts in 2019, and, and guess what? The performance measurements that, um, they, that the government will use to determine performance begins in 2017. That's 11 months away, 11 months. So, in any event, you can see there kind of what I'm talking about, and you'll have that for your reference to talk about that with your provider staff. So let's kind of move to value-based care. So this isn't a hard concept. Value-based care is care that improves clinical quality, increases community health, and uses resources wisely. You all are familiar with the triple aim, or now um, CMS has co-opted this. Um, they, they now call it improved community health, better pay, patient care, and smarter spending. A little bit different words in the triple aim, but it's, it's the same thing. So we need, as health care providers, to develop the capacity, the resources, the processes, the policies, the infrastructure to deliver value-based care, care that improves clinical quality, increases community health, and uses resources wisely concurrently, concurrently. So in response to that, the Rural Health Value Team developed an online tool, a tool that assesses a, we, we primarily designed for hospitals, for, for rural hospitals, but no reason why this couldn't be as a, a concept for more of a system. But, but again, the frame of reference is a critical assets hospital to assess value-based care readiness. Here's the purposes of this tool. First, Duh, we really want to help healthcare organizations develop value-based value care capacity. If you're going to get paid for value-based care in the future, you've got to deliver the care. This, this is pretty simple. And if fee-for-service, if the pillar of fee-for-service is being attacked again and again and again, 
you, we need to be looking for different payment models. And if we want to take advantage of new value-based payment models, we have to go to value-based care. Secondly, we've heard loud and clear, especially from thoughtful hospital leaders, that my, my team doesn't quite understand this, my directors don't understand it, my community stakeholders don't understand this. So we can use this tool to educate, educate as well, too. Next, prioritize. You can't do everything at once. You, you shouldn't do everything at once for a variety of reasons that we could talk about at a different time. But we do need to prioritize, and this can help you do that. And then lastly, help us, us in the rural health value team and people like the National Re, uh, Rural Resource Center and people like RHI to, to identify and develop the tools to help that process. Really, this is our purpose of the, of the tool. Here's how we designed it. First, it's online, an online assessment tool. It assesses 121 value-based care capacities, capacities, just remember that infrastructure, policies, processes I was talking about, grouped in eight categories. And I'll read those quickly. Governance and leadership, care management, clinical care, community health, patient and family engagement, performance improvement, health information technology, and financial risk management, those eight categories. So let me describe um, a capacity. And forgive me on the uh, formatting, I think as it got um, converted uh, for this presentation, our formatting got a bit screwed up, but I think you can kind of, kind of read this. So once again, the capacities are healthcare organization, resources, processes, infrastructure, et cetera, to deliver value-based care. And let me just kind of show you some examples. So here's a compa uh, an example. And, and you'll, you may see through this presentation and actually on the, uh, the tool itself, HCO, that stands for healthcare organization. Uh, even though, as I mentioned, the frame of reference is primarily a critical access hospital, but it need not be that way. It could certainly be an FQHC or an RHC. Um, or a, a health system. But so here's some examples. The HCO assesses and identifies patients at high risk for poor outcomes or high resource utilization and then assigns the care manager, care manager to them. That, that would be a capacity. Um, here's another capacity for non-urgent cl urgent clinic visits. We do pre-visit pre planning for complex patients. So we can assure, uh, ensure when that patient arrives, they will receive all the care that they need, not just the care that they're there for, for, but all the care that they do. The HCO um, strategic planning incorporates measurable population health goals that reflect the health needs of the community. Remember that imp improved community health part of the triple M name? That, that's there. So these are capacities. I'm double clicking for some reason here, so kind of thanks for putting up with me. So when you do this assessment, when you do the value-based care tool, You'll be assessing each one of these capacities in this way. You'll ask yourself in your organization, again, re repeating myself, kind of thinking of the, the frame of reference as a critical access hospital, is this particular value-based care capacity fully de developed and deployed throughout the organization? Is it developed and incompletely deployed? Is it in development? Is it in discussion? Is it not really applicable to your situation? or you just really haven't considered that particular um, capacity at all. Six different potential um, responses. So this is how you say, well, well, how do I do this? How do I do this? Well, this is what we recommend. First, you put your, your leadership team together in your meeting room with internet access and, and a screen. So we, since I said this is an online tool, you bring the tool up on the screen, and you complete it together as a leadership team. So you're accomplishing a couple things with this approach. One, that it, remember that education part that I was talking about. You know, as your team looks at this, you say, well, I didn't think that that was something that maybe we should be considering for the future success of our organization. And so, it, so it's an educational tool. Um, next, it's a strategic planning tool. I mean, you, you do this together to think strategically about the future of your organization. This is, I can hardly think of something more strategically important for a healthcare organization than 
trying to understand and plan for fulfilling its mission. And that mission is probably something like providing high-quality care to our community. Fulfilling its mission in a resource environment that's changing, in a finance and payment environment that's changing. Can you really think of anything more strategic than that? Well, as I said in one bullet here, this is an important part of strategic planning. So this is how you do it. You simply go to www.ruralhealthvalue.org, ruralhealthvalue.org, and then right there on that splash screen, there will be a link to the value-based care assessment tool. And on, on, on that next click, you'll see a variety of resources kind of associated with that tool. An introductory letter, a how-to, the tool itself, and, and we'll talk about it in our next get-together, some uh, prioritization and action planning tools as well, too. And we'll talk about that actually on our next, our next call. That's where it is. Then, once you do this, um, we back at University of Iowa um, will uh, present to you a readiness report. It'll have a summary. I don't know about you guys, but my screen's being re refreshed, so hang loose with me. There we go. Um, it'll have a summary. It'll show your strengths, opportunities, considerations, and next steps. And I'll talk about that kind of in just a, just a moment. But you see on the screen those value-based care capacity percentages by, by category. So it's, it's, a, it's, a in, in, uh, it's within your organization comparison, within your organization comparison. So we think that this will be sent to you within about two weeks. That's kind of our, that's kind of our goal. So. I, I mentioned that this is going to tell you your strengths and opportunities considerations. Well, the strengths are those capacities that you rated as a one or a two, fully developed and deployed or developed and incompletely deployed. So what do you do with that? Well, you celebrate. You celebrate that. This is really important, and you guys should be congratulated, and your team should be congratulated for the work that they're doing to, 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 to move towards the triple aim. And, you, and we need to measure that to measure progress. And then lastly, we need to keep our foot on the gas pedal. Um, we need to maintain maintain the momentum. So that's the strength. Now what about opportunities? Here's my favorite part. The number three, in development. Now why do I say that this is this is really, really important? You're all you as an organization are already thinking about this. You're 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 already kind of thinking that this is something that may be important for your organization to be successful in. And, and serve its mission and be successful in the future. So I believe this is where you should prioritize your efforts. It's not going to take much to cross the finish line, to, to cross that last hurdle, reasonable effort and resources to fully develop and deploy this capacity. Concentrate leadership attention here. And as maybe some of you heard me say in the past, recall that, that attention, attention is the currency of leadership. If you, as a healthcare leader, want to get something done, you attend to it. You attend to it. And that still uh, relieves consideration. And you may be like Homer now. What kind of what do I do with this? So the considerations are the last four categories: in discussion, not applicable, not considered, or heaven forbid, you left something blank <laughs> on on the tool. Well, you know what? There may be very good reasons for less leadership attention here. But um, to be quite honest, uh, the folks that have put this together, and I've had, I did a lot of literature search before putting this together. I involved a lot of really knowledgeable people to put this tool together. We believe that these capacities will eventually be important to virtually any healthcare system. Now, maybe you won't do each one yourself. That's not but it, these capacities will eventually need to be available to your communities, to your patients, and to your communities so we can deliver value-based care and hence <laughs> get paid for value-based care. So we would ask that you periodically consider value-based care capacities in the future. Um, I won't read this next steps. Um, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, actually in our next our next call together. But again, like that macro um, graphic I provided for you, um, I wanted to kind of show you that we are thinking through you know what do we what do we do next, 
and that is there uh, for for your reference. A couple of caveats for you. Um, this is not designed for inter-hospital comparisons. I'll tell you though, <laughs> every time that we piloted this and talked about it, um, the, the competitive spirit in hospital leaders really seems to bubble to the surface. They really want to know how they're comparing to their peers. So because of that outcry from the field, if we have enough um, organizations completing the value-based care tool, then I, I think what uh, certainly we can do with the University of Iowa is to develop some comparison reports. But I do want to emphasize this is not designed to compare yourself to your neighbor. This is designed for you to think strategically about how to uh, serve on your mission and be successful in a payment world that is shifting from volume, which includes fee-for-service and cost-based reimbursement, to one that is value-based. Value it is really, I, I was asked, and it's a really good question, and I was asked by someone, has this been validated? And my first response back was, I, I, I suspect you mean validated to uh, financial success, or validated to I won't go, um, I won't go bankrupt, or validated towards um, I will successfully negotiate my insurance contracts, my network contracts. No, it has not been validated in that in that way. Doesn't predict contract negotiation sex, organizational profitability, managerial effectiveness. We don't have enough data to be able to do that. I would love to have the data to be able to do that. Um, you know, I, I'm a clinician by training, but geez, I, I work in a research organization, so I want to know what works for rural people, places, and providers to be successful. I want to know that, but we don't have the data to be able to do that yet. However, however, we do feel that the value-based care tool can assist rural health organizations to value value-based care capacity. And, and as I've mentioned, this movement in the payment world, healthcare payment world, is relentless. We can argue about how fast, we can argue about how, how much, but the shift from our old world is um, moving. The, the fee-for-service pillar is crumbling, and we need to be prepared in a mindful way how to um, access value-based payment in the future. Again, as I've mentioned before, we can educate leaders, directors, and stakeholders, and, and this will help us prioritize action as an integral part of our strategic strategic planning. I'll finish here um, with a slide about our Rural Health Value um, project. Again, it's, it's housed at ruralhealthvalue.org. It's funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. It's a joint effort between um, us at Rupri and the University of Iowa, and Stratus Health, the Quality Improvement uh, Network uh, Director for um, Minnesota, also uh, working with Wisconsin and Michigan. And, and we are continually working on developing, finding, disseminating new tools and uh, resources. Um, I mentioned the value-based care strategic planning tool today, obviously. Um, uh, next time we talk, I'm going to talk about a fee-for-service and cost-based reimbursement financial performer, among other things, next time. Um, I've almost got ready to go. Kind of a, several resources around uh, physician engagement or probably more globally provider engagement. Um, when, for those of you who are kind of wondering, what, what does it mean financially to my organization? Um, if accountable care organization contract, a better word is a shared savings contract. We're developing a, um, a tool, uh, Excel-based tool, pretty sophisticated uh, for evaluating that. That will be uh, sometime later this spring. And as I said here, uh, uh, more to come. So that finishes my uh, comments. Um, I would be happy to uh, uh, take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Clint. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to press star 2 to unmute your line or you may type your question into the chat box. Um, there's also the option to send me a private chat by hovering over my name at the top of the attendee list.
You know that Washington private chat. Rural Health. <laughs> yeah. That private chat. Rural Health. A little, a little bit weird, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for those of you that feel like maybe you have a question that um, maybe seems feels dumb to you, but um, you can go ahead and send that to me, and and I will relay it. Um, Clint, yeah, no Washington Rural Health Collaborative is wondering: Is there a cost for the use of the tool or the readiness report back? Excellent question. And hello to my friends at the Washington Rural Health Collaborative. Um, no cost whatsoever. None. So this is a free online tool. Um, we ask uh, that you do it online, not because we're interested in your particular responses, but we do want to start collecting responses, again, from that research perspective and as a way for us to better understand what tools and resources are needed in the field to help rural um, hospitals and other providers move successfully from volume to value. So this is free, um, free online, and the uh, report back is free as well. Thank you very much for asking that question. Great. Does anyone else have any questions? We have about 25 minutes uh, here to ask Clint questions. Clint, our revenue, our revenue is cost-based. Why do we need to consider value-based care? Well, thanks for asking that one, Kim. So um, let me just kind of take a, take a moment here and, and um, repeat and expand a little bit on kind of what I, I mentioned before. Um, it, it, when, we, when we think about our payment systems right now, um, we are primarily fee-for-service or cost-based reimbursement. Um, those are both volume-based. Now, people may kind of say, no, wait a minute, uh, but it doesn't matter what my volume is if I'm cost-based reimbursement. I always, you know, I, I don't make any profit, but I don't make any loss. Not true. Not true. The more volume you bring into your cost-based organization, the lower it's going to cost you to deliver a unit of service. And I, I won't go into the details of that, but the successful critical access hospital is the one that really fills its beds, keeps all of its providers busy. Because when you're doing high volume, it makes your for-profit contracts, your Blue Cross Blue Shields, your Aetna's, your United contracts, that much more profitable. If it, if it costs you $1,000 to deliver a unit of service and Medicare pays you $1,000 and Blue Cross Blue Shield Pay, pays you $1,100. The more services you provide, the less per unit of cost to this. For example, maybe if as we do more and more and more, the per unit of service cost will drop down to only $900. So, so therefore, now on our Blue Cross Blue Shield contracts, we just make $200, not the $100. And we could talk about that in more detail with accountants kind of stuff. And, and anytime you're talking to a physician about finances, it's always dangerous. But the truth of the matter is, Cost-based reimbursement is a volume-based system. Um, but, and the feds realize that. Everybody realizes that. And, and our ability to negotiate with the government, um, which, you know, you might think the government's big and powerful, but they're, they're kind of sissies when it comes to negotiating, to be honest with you. Sissies compared to Medicare Advantage plans. Sissies compared to Medicaid managed care organizations. And what's the number? Something like 26 states right now are using Medicaid MCOs to, to deliver a payment for, for Medicaid, something, something like that. We're seeing increasing use of Medicare Advantage. We've heard people say Medicare Advantage for all. So our ability to negotiate the old way of payment, old way of payment, revenue times volume, or excuse me, price times volume equals revenue, is going away. And, and I, I, I think if we continue to predicate our strategy on this um, old form of payment, we better strategically be planning for less and less and less revenue over time. Now, that doesn't mean that we just have to go eventually go out of business because the government and others are offering us new payment systems, new payment systems. 
And that's what I described. I described that as the alternative payment models from care, the MIPS and alternative payment bonus um, for physicians, um, and, and then the commercial market saying by 2020 we want 75% of our uh, business uh, to be in value-based value -based contracts. So all that sounds fine and good, except for one thing. You can't, it can't be business as usual. The, our, our ability to make money in a value-based payment world is absolutely, definitionally predicated on being able to deliver value-based care. And it is from an operational standpoint 100 per, 180 degrees different than volume-based care. What is, the, what is the business, the financial imperative in a fee-for-service, cost-based reimbursement environment? In and out of the beds as fast as possible. In and out through the office, clinic office door as fast as possible. On the hamster wheel again and again and again. And as I've said before, if we could just pause for a moment of reflection, is that the way we want our providers to be incented? And I think most of us would say would say no. So um, the new system is maybe too slow, too fast, depending on your perspective, uh, but is relentlessly uh, moving to something different. Now, my bias is it's the right way to move. I, I, I'm, I am a rural people advocate and have been my whole career. I think eventually, we get past the transition, as Eric Shaw calls the shaky bridge, um, I think this is going to be a better world for rural people and places. But it's going to be tough, and it's going to take planning. And hence, I believe that the value-based care tool is one way for rural providers to start thinking strategically about how we are going to deliver value-based care in, in the future, and thinking strategically, thoughtfully, not betting the farm, not staring at our navels. <laughs> Um, but thoughtfully preparing uh, for a value-based care future. And this is a tool to help you do that. Long answer. Sorry, Kim. Great answer. Thank you so much, Clint. Does anyone else have any questions for Dr. McKinney? Star 2 to unmute or go ahead and chat, type them into the chat box. Clint, why do you call this a strategic planning tool? Oh, uh, really good. So um, if, this, if this is just a, a, an exercise and kind of it's, it's fun and it's, and it's something to kind of get us together and eat donuts, it's a waste of time. Um, we believe this will take one and a half hours or so to do. Uh, now, um, one and a half hours may seem like a long time to kind of be in a meeting or maybe even a little bit longer if you're really thoughtful. When we're thinking strategically um, about how do we prepare to deliver on our mission in a payment world that demands, that requires us to deliver value-based care, increasingly requires value-based care, is, is that not important? So strategic, strategic is um, that thinking that's um, organization-wide and longitudinal in time. It's, it's not single focused. Now, from strategy comes actions. So, so I am exquisitely action oriented, and that's what we'll talk about when we're together next. Is so, how do we take something that's a strategic? I almost said exercise, but maybe still, I'll, I'll use that word because I don't have another one right at the top of my head. A strategic exercise and turn it into something that actually makes a difference in an organization, and we'll. Talk about that, but the, but why it's strategic is it's a it's thinking in a broad and longitudinal way about how we can deliver on our mission. And remember, for those of you that are not for profits or governmental agencies, that, that is your job. That is your job as a leader. That is your job as a director or a trustee. It is to deliver on the mission. Deliver on the mission. So it's strategic to figure out when the resources required to deliver on our mission are shifting under our feet, 
then how will we adjust our operations, um, our policies, our procedures, our compensation systems, our incentives to be able to respond positively to the shifting payment system so we can continue to deliver on our mission in perpetuity? Again, maybe long answer, but this is strategic. This is strategic. Thank you, Clint. Um, Clint, David has the question. How do you start this dialogue with your physicians to join in an APM? Oh, oh boy, that's really good. Um, in fact, interestingly, um, that's why one of the reasons why I'm in Alaska um, right now is kind of working just at that. Now, um, if, if, David, if I could, um, let me ref first refer you to our website in maybe a couple of weeks because I put together some information um, that I've produced in, um, around physician engagement. So the, so the first step of the conversation is, um, do we have them kind of interested in um, uh, being interdependently strong? Um, have we um, acknowledged and helped their independence along with ours? And, and have we discovered ways for us together to be interdependent. Um, so, are they are they engaged, for for lack of a better better word? So, I have some, I have resources kind of coming up uh, to talk about physician physician engagement. Next, I think one of the techniques to to talk to people about um, almost anything is to understand kind of what's in it for them. What, why would they be interested in what you're delivering here? And there probably <laughs> there, there probably is universal interest in what's going to happen to my paycheck. And and again, when I was in private practice in Northeast Iowa, 65% of my patient visits were 65 and older. So I'm going to just kind of make a guess. That we I didn't talk about when I was in private practice. I didn't talk about payer mix, but I suspect that my payer mix was about 65% Medicare. So again, like I said, when Medicare speaks, man, we better listen because it's going to hit me in my pocketbook. And and also, um, so so I think I think they need to know about macro. They need to know about that. So they need to know what what their liabilities and their opportunities are. Are in macro, and for those of, of the providers that are American Academy of Family Physicians, there's great resources, um, and I suspect those are internists and other professions have similar kind of professional side. So, so understanding what 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 what's in it for them. Um, the other other issue is a little softer, um, but I think for some physicians, even more important. And, and that that is something a, a little squishy. And, and I, I wanted to be a doctor since I was probably in junior high, I think. You know, and, and when I was in high school in in the seven, early 70s, um, I, I don't think I, I thought of kind of a family physician as kind of the churn and burn. You know, the way I, the way I pay for my kids' college education. I see as many patients as possible. I think I saw, the, saw, saw it as the medical home, I think. Of course, I didn't have those words. But I think that's what I kind of saw it, saw it as. So it, I think that eventually, and, and, and remember, we still live in a fee-for-service world. And this is really important. So we, we need to acknowledge that. We live in a fee-for-service world, and we don't make these moves until the payment moves with us but we start to prepare for them. And if we can help physicians maybe see that in a value-based payment future, there may be latitude to get off the hamster wheel for a moment and still make a fair living, and still make a fair living. So that will appeal to different physicians differently. Um, I think it, it, as I was talking with physicians here in Alaska yesterday, um, it became really clear that these guys are so busy 
they can't get off the hamster wheel long enough to think about a future that's different than what they have right now. So one of my jobs, leadership jobs, will be to present the future in a way that they can digest quickly, understand what their role will be in it, and understand the way for them to adapt easily without with less disruption, but still adapt, and, and hopefully be more satisfied professionals in the future, and, and oh, by the way, make a buck as well, too. Hope that's helpful. Hope so. Thank you, Clint. A question from Gunnison Valley Hospital in Utah that probably a lot, of, a lot of other hospitals have as well. I still struggle with exactly what value-based payment means in a rural setting. Can you give some specific examples of payment methodologies in rural settings that are value-based? Absolutely. Here it is. Do you employ physicians? If you employ physicians in 2019, in 2019, their payment will change, good or bad. I don't know yet. And if your if your revenue is dependent upon physician revenue, your revenue will change too. So that's that's number number one. Um, number two, we in critical access hospitals, we are currently exempt from the value based purchasing. Uh, either bonus or or a penalty that PPS hospitals are exposed to. Do any of us think that that really will last forever? Do we really think that it, that it will? Um, no, it it won't. We will eventually be um, subject to value-based purchasing type penalties. The way it kind of often happens is you see you know you'll see. Performance measurement is recommended. Performance <laughs> measurement is demanded. Performance measurement is publicly reported. Pu performance measurement is used to drive to drive payment. So, so that that will I think eventually happen. In fact, in fact, um, people like the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy and CMS have even asked us, can it help us figure out how would we do value-based payment in in rural hospitals? So that's that's. That's going to happen. Um, think, think about um, next um, your your profit bearing contracts. Your profit bearing contracts. Remember, how much money do you make in Medicare? Zero. How much money do you make in Medicaid? Probably less than zero, or maybe you may be one of the cost based states. That you know, I don't know. How much do you make in Medicare Advantage? Do you make significantly more than cost based reimbursement? So, so your profit generating contracts are Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, United, you know, whomever, probably, probably. Do we do we think that they're going to continue to raise their payments to you um, in perpetuity as fast as your costs are going up? Maybe. I kind of doubt it though. And and in fact, when I see the big purchaser, the big payers of healthcare saying, um, at, by, by 2020, I want 75% of my payments tied to value in some way. And the movement from 2013 to 2014 was from 11 to 40% for commercial in-network, admittedly in-network payments. Um, I, I, I think I think we're going to we're going to continue we're going to see that um, ebb into rural as well too. Then the next question is networks. Um, this is this is quite real. This is quite real. I just talked with a hospital in Wisconsin that lost a large contract with the school district. Now, um, in, I, I might say that they lost that contract um, because they weren't providing the best value to the school district. Um, but I think they lost it because their costs were higher. Their costs were higher, so they lost. They lost business because of they weren't being able to deliver value as well as their competitors. Um, and I, I, I think network adequacy issue is going to get tougher for us before it gets easier. We can fall back on the on the um, need for access um, only so far. Insurers and payers are getting pretty creative about how 
to put their patients together with providers that aren't necessarily proximate. Um, virtual visits, for example, are, are really coming on coming on strong. Um, so I, I think that um, our challenge strategically, and again, we can certainly we can certainly disagree. 